Welcome to, today, to today's second panel, What's Next for the Russia-China Partnership? Implications for the United States and the World. I'm Midshipman Second Class Van Ocean, and I'm honored to introduce our esteemed moderator this afternoon. Dr. Rosalind Engel is a non-resident scholar in the American Statecraft Program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Dr. Engel is a graduate of the London School of Economics and received her PhD in economics from Columbia University. She has served as the National Intelligence Officer of Economics at the ODNI and was a professor at the Naval Academy for three years. Her current position is the Chief Economic Strategist at the MITRE Center, and her, re her research expertise is in the conjunction of economics and national security. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Engel and our panelists. So I hope you can hear me okay? Yes. Yes? Okay, because I dropped my mic on the way in. Okay, so good. Um, so it's my great pleasure to be here today to moderate. Um, I'm going to start um, by introducing our speakers, and then we'll get right into um, some questions for everyone. Um, so to my right, um, far right, is Chris Bort. Um, Chris is a non-resident scholar at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Uh, he is also a uh, former NIO, uh, you'll see a theme here, former <laughs> NIO for Russia and Eurasia, um, 2017 to 2021, um, and has almost 40 years of public service um, looking uh, at Russian foreign policy issues, um, a deep expert, and we're very glad to have him here. Next, we have uh, Dr. Lyle Goldstein. Uh, Lyle is at uh, the Watson Institute at Brown University. He's a visiting professor there after a 20-year career um, at the Naval War College, uh, where he founded the China Maritime Studies Institute. Yes. Right? Okay. Uh, and is also the director for Asia Engagement at Defense Priorities in Washington. Um, to my left is Admiral William Mertz, um, very recently former um, Deputy CNO, uh, which I think was just Friday, did you just say? That's right. Friday. Um, so awaiting uh, retirement, um, I guess, is a couple months away. Uh, a former commander, um, I'm trying to remember, wait, so. Seventh Fleet. Seventh Fleet, sorry. Uh, a sub <laughs> Submariner, uh, 1986 uh, USNA grad. Uh, next to Admiral Mertz is Angela Stent. Um, she's a senior advisor at Georgetown Center for Eurasian, Russian, and Eastern European mm -hmm. Studies. Uh, also a non-resident scholar at the Brookings Institute. Also a former NIO <laughs> for Russia, Eurasia. Um, so also a deep expert in, in Russia issues. And finally, all the way to the left um, is uh, Randy Shriver, who is the chairman of the project 2049 Institute, uh, also a former Assistant Secretary for Indo-Pacific um, Security Affairs, uh, and also a, a former U Naval Officer in Intelligence for a couple years, active duty and some years in reserve. So we have a great panel. Um, so I, let me just get started here. My goal here is to do a little bit of a deep dive into Russia first, then a little bit of a deep dive into China. Uh, Admiral Mertz has the uh, unfortunate duty of wrapping all of that up and getting us started on the, the what's next, what's ahead, some of the strategic questions that we want to get to. So first, Chris. Um, Chris, can you tell us a little bit about the kind of here and now that's face, facing uh, Russia in Ukraine, um, also it's uh, sort of Central Asia, kind of what's, what's the thinking in Moscow, what's going mostly wrong, I think, um, but also anything that they think might be going right. Can you tell us a little bit maybe about the Putin-Xi relationship? I just kind of want to get a little bit of a kind of current here and now on Russia and some, some of the things that are going on. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question, Ross. Uh, thanks. You know, the, a lot more things have gone wrong than have gone right for Russia this past year. And I think that you can start with, uh, you know, what has been an unvetted and unvettable foreign policy. This is the root of, uh, of Russia's strategic difficulties this year. And by that I mean, um, you know, authoritarian systems uh, may be good for certain things. They can move on a dime, they can change policy on a dime, they can mobilize resources, but they do not correct well for mistakes. And in this case, uh, you have a uh, policymaking apparatus in Russia that consists of uh, one man's brain. And this has been the problem uh, that separates 
even a system like Putin's from that of, say, Nikita Khrushchev or Lenin Brezhnev, where there was much more of an, even that, a collective decision-making apparatus. In Russia, you have none of that. And so you have a foreign policy uh, that is filtered through and is the product of, uh, of one person, which is not to say that Putin doesn't have you know, some people around him. We, we all know them. We know their names. We know the Sergei Shoigus, the uh, Gerasimovs, uh, the Bortnikovs, these people who, uh, who, who are nominally you know, charged with, uh, with policy recommendations. But as I see it, these people are mostly, uh, mostly become uh, uh, facilitators, enablers. They are uh, yes men to uh, uh, validate what was uh, the president's decision. And in this case, um, it's my contention that almost no one within the Russian elite was, uh, was of a mind that the solution to Russia's problems with the United States and with uh, securing its near abroad was to have a full-scale invasion of Ukraine. I think the insiders largely shared Putin's view of, uh, of his, his sense of grievance against the United States, his sense that the United States was encouraging uh, actively and indirectly Ukraine's realignment towards the West. Um, but that anyone's best solution to regaining Russian dominion over Ukraine was through a full-scale invasion, I think uh, was, uh, that was not the case. This was entirely Putin's own, um, own vision of how to fix this problem, and no one could stop it. That's the way I see it. So, how does this, you know, impact on the discussion we're having today about uh, about Russia and China, uh, and, and and we can talk about how it's affected you know, Russia's position, as you asked, inside the, the uh, near abroad, the so-called near abroad. By the way, I like to say so-called near abroad because saying near abroad is kind of like borrowing Russian narratives. Uh, that's been kind of the problem. They don't see it as real abroad. They see it as kind of not fully abroad. Uh, we can talk about, uh, uh, you know, how Kazakhstan uh, surprisingly has found ways to push back uh, against uh, against Russia. Uh, Takayev, President Takayev, has been unique among uh, uh, some of the leaders in Russia's neighborhood at, at pushing back because he knows that he could well be next. The territories in uh, um, uh, northern Kazakhstan could easily, <coughs> easily be Putin's next target. So uh, we could talk about Belarus. We could talk about how Lukashenko has, uh, has uh, lost his moorings and become entirely an appendage uh, of Russian foreign policy while still trying to hold Putin off from <coughs> forcing his troops into an active invasion of Ukraine. All these things are very important. But to talk about what we're here to talk about today, uh, and Putin and China, Putin's strategic mistakes of the last uh, year uh, have had a direct impact. Uh, he and the, his fellow decision makers, to the extent that they are decision makers, have had to essentially allay any concerns, any of the concerns that they have about becoming an increasing, increasingly becoming a vassal of China uh, because they have no choice. Uh, the strategic blunders that uh, I see Putin as having committed have forced the Russian elite to swallow hard and to just accept that whatever China wants from this relationship, uh, whatever benefits Russia can carve out from this relationship is what Russia will have to be content with. I don't see anyone on the inside in Russia being thrilled, being happy, uh, you know, embracing the idea of being China's 
vassal, of being a, what they call a raw materials appendage to China. That's, that's not the case. It's anything but. But they have no choice. Uh, the common uh, foe that is the United States uh, is the greatest glue driving these two countries together. Uh, and that is uh, the, the, the beauty of this from China's perspective, I think, is that they have an increasingly weak Russia that is going to be increasingly dependent on China. And that suits the Chinese leadership just fine, as, as I understand. But others, can, um, others who are more expert can talk about that. So that is, um, that is where the Russians find themselves at the end of uh, 2022, uh, in a position where they're increasingly dependent on China. And um, as long as China plays its cards you know, reasonably well and doesn't actively humiliate Russia, which I, I see no reason for them to, to want to do, uh, this situation could, uh, could obtain for quite a while. Great, thanks Chris. Um, so I'm gonna move on to Angela. Um, Angela, I'm hoping you can kind of um, zoom out a little bit now and describe some of the U.S.-Russia relationship. Um, we can start with just a, you know, 2014 or wherever you wanna start, but kind of trying to get us to where we are now. Mm -hmm. um, some of the changes in the U.S. view on, on Russia, maybe the changes in the Russian view on us, um, but that kind of, you know, those, that U.S.-Russia relationship, I think would be interesting. Thank you. So I think I have five minutes to do what would normally be a 40-minute lecture, but I'll try. <laughs> uh, I'll go back to 2014, and I would say since 2014, the main thrust of U.S. policy has been prov to prevent Russia from further disrupting its neighborhood and the collective West and from interfering even more in our own domestic politics and those of our allies. For the last two years of the Obama administration, this involved working to secure allied unity on sanctions after the Russian uh, annexation of Crimea um, and the downing of the MH17 airline uh, over Ukraine. But it also did involve US and Russian militaries working together to deconflict our operations in Syria after Russia entered the Syrian war um, on the side of Bashar al-Assad. And of course, in 2016, the US administration did focus, I would say belatedly, on recognizing the extent of Russian interference in the US presidential election campaign. And of course, at the very end of uh, 2016, did impose more sanctions on Russia. And a senior Obama administration official described to me a situation of tremendous frustration with dealing with an increasingly aggressive Russia. Um, and an increasingly anti-Western Russia. So, during the Trump administration, of course, you had a bifurcated policy toward Russia. You had the president himself who uh, sought to improve ties with Russia, but then you had the rest of the executive branch uh, uh, of his administration that continued to work to constrain Russian actions. And in fact, you had rafts of sanctions during the Trump administration against Russia. Uh, you also had the US withdrawing from the INF Treaty and from the Open Skies Treaty. And then you had the unsuccessful successful attempt to negotiate a new strategic arms treaty, but including China. And of course, uh, China refused to even contemplate the idea of entering into negotiations like that. So the Biden administration uh, came in saying it wanted to uh, pursue a stable and predictable relationship with Russia, that it wanted to create guardrails around the relationship with Russia so that it could focus on its major um, antagonist, uh, the People's Republic of China. Um, and so in the beginning, it looked as if maybe that would be possible. Uh, it extended the New START uh, uh, Treaty on Strategic Nuclear Weapons, and it did open up negotiating channels with Russia. We tend to forget this, <laughs> uh, but it did happen, uh, last year at least, on strategic stability, on climate change, on the Arctic, on cyber, both commercial and, uh, and other cyber uh, interference. Then when Russia tr presented these three draft treaties last December, demanding concessions from NATO and from the United States, uh, the US, I would say, went some way towards meeting Russian concerns and even offered some concessions. We now know that all of these treaties, it was just a sham. They were presented to sort of delay maybe the, uh, the invasion of Ukraine. Uh, because at the same time, of course, the US 
uh, was telling the Russians that we knew what was going on. We knew that they were amassing all these troops on the Belarusian uh, Ukrainian border and warning them not to do it, um, obviously to no avail. So the current strategy, to US strategy toward Russia, um, it's rather minimalist, <laughs> but it is similar to the previous one, containing Russia's aggressive designs on its neighborhood, and now even on Central Europe, as was mentioned earlier today, the Russians have now basically said NATO should withdraw to where it was before the first uh, enlargement occurred in 1999. Um, and, and the other part of the strategy is obviously supporting Ukraine militarily. We've heard a lot about that today already. Um, high level engagement between the White House and the Kremlin and between our militaries, uh, which is sporadic but still goes on, it's obviously designed to uh, avoid further escalation and of course also to warn Russia of the consequences of escalation, including uh, of course the use potential use of a tactical nuclear weapon. Um, but, you know, we've just had the latest warnings from uh, Defense Minister Shoigu, calls to his counterparts here and in Europe, warning that the Ukrainians are planning on using a dirty bomb uh, and then blaming Russia for it. Um, and, of course, all of our defense ministers, secretaries of defense, have responded that this, of course, is not a credible threat. And I think we all have to listen to what President Zelensky says when his admonition that when Russia accuses Ukraine of doing something, that is in fact what Russia itself plans to do. Um, what is the current U.S. strategy toward Russia? I guess I quote uh, Secretary Austin, to see Russia weakened as a result of this war. President Biden has said that Putin should go. Um, that apparently is not administration, official administration policy. Um, and of course it's to ensure, and we've heard this already, that Russia does not win this war, that it doesn't take any more territory, uh, because if it were to do that, then of course it would continue westward if it had the military ability to do so. Um, the White House has repeatedly said it will not impose a negotiated settlement uh, on Ukraine that would involve a loss of territory. Um, it's really very difficult now to see the sort of pre-war or previous US compartmented relationship with Russia, which has existed really since the collapse of the Soviet Union, where we cooperate on some issues and we compete on others, and that's been the norm for the past 30 years until the war broke out. Um, it's very difficult to see that reemerge for the foreseeable future unless there is regime change in Russia. So let me say just a couple of words now about the Russian view of the United States, and Chris Board has already talked about some of this. Um, how, how have Russian views changed, I think, was your question, too. So we have uh, Vladimir Putin, the KGB judoist. He's always been suspicious of the United States. He doesn't understand the United States very well at all. But I think we can say that his animosity toward the US has increased, particularly during these kind of two years of COVID isolation, when he apparently was just with a small group of people reinforced all of his prejudices and not meeting with other uh, global leaders as a result of COVID. Um, he believes that the US seeks regime change in Russia. He believes that the US is trying to break up Russia. He talks about that frequently. Um, and then all the other things. He believes that the West is satanic, uh, that we've all been captured by unbridled wokeness, and that Russia is the true harbinger of Christianity and morality uh, going forward. We've heard him say all of this. Um, and he's also very acutely aware of how polarized our society is now. I, want, I mean, people have said that earlier on today, just to reinforce that. He looks at the United States, he sees the polarization, he sees the fragility of our democracy, and he still is willing to do everything he can to amplify these divisions uh, through all of the disinformation campaigns. But he has had some shocks recently, and we're not sure whether he's learned from these shocks. Um, he believed that the US, after the chaotic withdrawal from Afghanistan, would not respond vigorously to the invasion of Ukraine and would not be able to muster a coalition of our European and Asian allies to push back against what Russia is doing and to sanction Russia. Um, and of course, he was wrong on both counts. But he has managed to persuade his own people, still a majority of them, if we believe the uh, public opinion polls, um, that Russia had to go to war with Ukraine um, because, NATO, um, because of NATO provocations. Um, and he has convinced them that he's fighting a proxy war with the United States. Um, 
he um, is still trying to create his disruptive world order. I do not believe that China and Russia have a similar vision of what they want a post-West order to look like. I think the Chinese want one that has some rules. I think Putin's vision is of, is of a world order without rules and a completely disruptive one. And of course, he believes very strongly that uh, there are only a few truly sovereign countries in the world, Russia is one of them, and that the rest of the countries, particularly countries like Ukraine or Poland, uh, are not fully sovereign and shouldn't be. Um, and my final point is now on the, the US current view of the, of the Russian-Chinese uh, relationship. Um, I do think that the Biden administration now understands this as a combined challenge. I'm not so sure that it was seen as such uh, uh, a few years ago. Um, and it did come into office <laughs> seeking to persuade Russia to distance itself from China. Uh, as we know, that hasn't happened. Um, after the war began, right, the US did warn the Chinese not to supply the Russian with, Russians with weapons. And as far as we know, they haven't done so, so far. And we also know that the Chinese have been very careful uh, to comply with the sanctions because they don't want to be the subject of secondary sanctions. Um, but when I look at the national security strategy, which was already mentioned earlier, um, I, I, I do ask the question, um, Russia is a military threat, maybe not to the United States, but certainly to our allies. It's an aggressive country. It might make sense uh, to, to, to try and partner more with the Chinese in trying to restrain what Russia is doing. And yet what we seem to have is a policy of having both of these countries as our main antagonists. And I would argue that in the, in the past years, I think particularly during the Trump administration, the US did things to push China and Russia closer together. And I think we have to sort of bear that in mind as we go forward to, to have policies that don't do that. Okay, great. So I'm um, going to use this as a jumping off point to go over to China. We're going to try and get the sort of same um, kind of questions asked. But basically, uh, Randy, I'm hoping you can talk a little bit about how the U.S.-China relationship has been evolving, um, how the Chinese strategic view on the United States is evolving, its view of itself, which we have, you know, the CC, we have the party congress from last week to, to inform some of that now. Um, just to kind of set up uh, the relationship and where it might be going. Sure. Well, thank you. So I like how you asked the question about how it's evolving because the U.S.-China relationship, the modern U.S.-China relationship, which I would put at 1979 on, the full normalization, diplomatic relations, um, the relationship has always been a blend of some amount of optimism and searching for alignment and common ground and some identification of risk and and uh, concern, and, and therefore the policy has always been so, some sort of blend of positive engagement, trying to nurture the potential opportunities and some hedging and, and, and some attempts at constrainment. Uh, what's happened over time is really that blend and mix have changed. And uh, my view would be that that was largely a result of uh, bets that didn't pay off, that our engagement strategy would help uh, on the margins shape China, shape its view of the world, shape its behavior. Uh, and to, to, to quote uh, former Deputy Secretary Zelik, it may see itself as a responsible stakeholder. And uh, as they were invited into the international and regional fora, might behave in a more constructive way, seeing itself as a, as a stakeholder, an equity holder in the international system, uh, largely created by the United States and Western countries. Uh, those bets uh, didn't really pay off. We got a different kind of China. Uh, the Chinese would have their own narrative on this as, as to what we did to contribute to, to things coming off the rails a little bit more. Um, but essentially, China's uh, shift into more assertive, provocative behavior started to change that blend and, and risk assessment, and, and the United States uh, started to uh, shift our policy. Um, people could put a, diff a, a different point in time on this. Uh, I, I think probably a good one is around 2008, 2009. Uh, that was the time, of course, of the great financial uh, crisis and, and Western uh, recession, uh, which the Chinese, if you, if you read the Chinese literature at the time, uh, they thought that this could finally be the point of precipitous U.S. Uh, fall and, and um, their opportunity. Uh, but I think that's a, 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 a relatively helpful way to look at it because there is a debate now, do, do we have a Xi Jinping problem or do we have a systemic CCP problem? 
And I think we really started to see more assertive behavior from the Chinese around that time, 2008, 2009, and really accentuated in 2010 with the Senkaku East China Sea uh, mini crisis. So with that change of behavior, I think the United States started to change our own blend, and our, own mi our own mix of those tools that were more directed at hedging and constraining versus the, the engagement. Um, again, I like the term evolution because, uh, because of some of the pointed language, some of the strategic documents and the way things were worded, there's a tendency on, on the part of some to see the Trump administration as an inflection point and sort of a radical departure from the past. Uh, I always said even when I was in office, the Trump administration was more evolutionary than revolutionary. If you look at uh, the so-called pivot or the rebalance, I'm not sure they ever settled on one of those descriptions, but you know, you remember the, the pivot, 60% of our naval forces were gonna be in the Pacific region. We were gonna uh, rebalance within the rebalance and, and work more with our Southeast Asian partners. We were gonna strengthen alliances. Um, economically reposition us to uh, strengthen our, our capabilities at home. All of this was really preserved into the next administration, albeit with, with uh, finer points on, on the nature of the relationship, that it was, we were using the term competitor. Uh, we were talking very openly about China as a, as a pacing element. And that has now been sustained into this administration. If you look at the national security strategy, what's been available, the national defense strategy, China's the pacing element, pacing challenge. Uh, Pacific is our priority theater and, and so on and so forth. So I think what we've seen is, is sort of this gradual move to a more competitive posture vis-a-vis -vis China. Now, our government does not move quickly, easily, or in unison. So I think what we've seen is uh, the defense establishment probably moving more quickly in the direction of adopting, it, adopting a competitive posture. That sort of makes sense. That's what defense ministries do. They think about worst case scenarios. They think about potential contingencies. Uh, but we have laggards within the US administration. And I think our economic agencies, uh, Commerce, USDR, Treasury, which you know, in fairness were created largely to promote US business interests. And, <laughs> originally promoting U.S. Uh, involvement in the Chinese market are, are a little slower to come to the, to the uh, position of adopting a competitive posture vis-a-vis -vis China. So I think what we have now is, is something where there's, there's a mindset, but it's a little uneven across uh, the, the U.S. government enterprise. Oh, and we're getting a lot of help from Congress. Uh, Congress is very focused on the China challenge. Uh, we had a number of huge China bills which sort of necked down to a single CHIPS Act bill, but there are uh, big plans for the next Congress uh, to pick up some of the parts of America Competes Act which, which dropped out. Um, you asked about the Chinese view uh, of us as well and how that informs everything. Um, I run an institute, as was mentioned, Project 2049. Uh, we have a very sophisticated methodology for understanding China or trying to understand China. And I'm going to put my IP at risk here. I'm going I'm to tell you openly uh, how we do it. Uh, we read what they write, and we listen to what they say, and we watch what they do. And I think doing that, you'll see a lot of suspicion directed at the U.S. going back decades. And they started to talk about us as enemy number one, a primary threat. Uh, well, well ago, again, decades. Uh, there were probably some things we did that uh, very much underscored that view when they, when they had that bias. Uh, the 95-96 Taiwan Strait crisis would probably be a good one to look at. Um, but I think that suspicion runs very deep. Um, their, their narratives are all informed by that. And so the, the distrust is really on, on both sides. Um, I think uh, the U.S. is open to finding those areas of alignment and continuing to have a positive engagement element to the relationship. Short of that, we want the kind of guardrails where we can communicate in clear ways and have the uh, process, processes in place to uh, manage crisis, make sure that accidents and incidents don't turn into military conflict. Uh, we have some of those modalities. Uh, ironically, they tend to uh, fail when we need the most. Uh, we create things like the Military Maritime Consultative Agreement, which looks great on paper. Uh, I can say that and, and hopefully not sound too immodest because I helped negotiate and draft it. But it failed miserably when we needed it most, right, on April 1st, 2001, when we had the EP3 incident. So I think the administration would like to work with China on things like climate change, on, uh, on, on the global pandemic and what comes next. I think they'd like the, the means to be able to ensure that 
uh, these political differences and differences in how we want the regional arch architecture to look uh, don't escalate into a greater crisis and, and even conflict. Uh, but we're struggling right now. We're struggling. We don't even know if there'll be a meeting at the G20 between President Biden and Xi Jinping after the Chinese have called that into question after the party congress. So uh, dis a lot of distrust on both sides. Fundamentally different aspirations and view for the regional and global architecture and struggling to have the guardrails in place to make sure that things don't get worse. So on that happy note. <laughs> All right, so we're going to land um, back with, uh, with Lyle, um, who's going to kind of run us through a little bit more of the here and now in terms of current flashpoints um, in and around um, uh, China's, I don't want to say near abroad, but um, in its uh, maritime, particularly maritime sphere. Uh, so it's everything from you know, the Korean Peninsula, South China Sea, East China Sea, um, the Sino-Indian border, I suppose, um, Taiwan. But if you could also maybe see what you could do to tie some of those um, flashpoints back to this China-Russia relationship, whether there's any kind of spillover there, are the Russians likely to be helpful in any of those, uh, not helpful? Um, so over to you. OK, great. Uh uh, I'm enjoying this conference immensely and um, honored to be here. Uh, it's a lot to cover in five minutes, um, <laughs> but uh, I, will, I will try my best. Um, uh, by the way, I, there's been a lot said about um, China's lessons from the Ukraine war. This is absolutely critical, and I just want to say I think I'm one of the few uh, panelists at the conference who speak uh, both Chinese and also Russian, so, you know, I have about, I've collected already more than 100 articles, so I have uh, some of it here I can show you. But, um, you know, this, uh, for instance, this uh, special issue documents a meeting in, in Changchun in June where this was uh, all discussed in a lot of detail. And I'm, I'm ready to provide, you know, lessons on air, land, and sea. So I think this is of great importance. And, and I hope maybe to come back to the academy and share a lot of those insights. It's, it's a lot of work to put it all together. But OK, let, let us talk some flashpoints. OK, we'll start it on the Korean Peninsula. I think uh, Kim Jong-un is a, is a major uh, beneficiary of all, all that's happened in Ukraine, for sure. Um, the possibility of breakout from sanctions is there. Why? Because uh, Putin and Kim Jong-un are now fully seeing eye to eye and you can bet uh, Putin is trying to persuade um, uh, the Chinese to also break out of sanctions. So this, we're going to see a lot of uh, interesting uh, things going on on the peninsula. On the, as far as um, uh, the Sino-Indian conflict, uh, well, we have been in a state of high tension since the Galwan uh, episode in June 2020. But I think there is some good news. Um, Lately, in September, there was a continued pullback from the border. And I have to believe that's partly related to the Ukraine, to what's going on in Ukraine, because uh, China and India are seeing a little bit eye to eye, right? Because they're both kind of being criticized by the West for not putting sanctions on Russia. So that's an interesting development. Uh, not much to say on the South China Sea related to Russia. China, Russia is not really a player there. Um, I mean, Vietnam is a country of great interest. and. If you're looking to drive wedges, the Vietnam is an, you know, an interesting country there because Russia traditionally has very strong relations with Vietnam and China has tensions. Uh, don't uh, miss the fact that the president of Indonesia, Joko Widodo, was wandering around Moscow, I think, in June, which is pretty incredible if you think about it. <laughs> Indonesia is not a, major, uh, not a minor player in, the, uh, in Southeast Asia. Well, let me turn to Taiwan with my remaining um, two minutes. Um, I think that absolutely uh, Xi Jinping is, uh, and his um, advisors are, are sobered, I think, by uh, the you know, tremendous uh, losses that Russia has suffered, including prestige. You know, they've seen the success of Stingers and Javelins and HIMARS and all these things. Uh, they've seen uh, sanctions, what a, you know, how harsh they can be. Um, However, comma, I, I, unfortunately, I see a lot of reasons why, uh, why the Chinese may not be deterred, uh, even looking at Ukraine. And part of this is the lessons that I'm, I'm reading about. Um, first of all, Ukraine uh, is about 15 times larger than Taiwan. You know, it was pointed out that Taiwan is about the size of Luhansk province. So this is a problem. Uh, moreover, China's military budget is about four to five times as large as Russia's. And you can see it across the forces. That, that really matters. So we have four to five times the firepower going into an area about 1 15th the size of Ukraine. Uh, 
uh, think about that, folks. Uh, obviously, it's a lot easier to cut off supplies. You won't be seeing you know, volunteers flowing into Taiwan. Once the balloon goes up, uh, China has a much higher tolerance for casualties than Russia. The Russians don't want their, their guys killed in Ukraine, not at all. I mean, there already is tremendous uh, opposition, not in China. Uh, and um, China, I think, has much more advanced training than Russia. Uh, they're, they're way ahead of Russia in critical areas like drone warfare. And of course, they're learning all these lessons, like I said, about uh, the importance of surprise, uh, the importance of mobilizing early, of uh, air support, of heavy firepower that's kind of merciless, that holds nothing back. Uh, and of course, they, know, they understand the pivotal importance of nuclear weapons here to deter the United States. Uh, so I'll just close by saying that one thing I'm extremely worried about is this, I think, China specialists are starting to call it the Gilday window, uh, which go, I, I think if, well, anyway, my concept of a window is this, that all these weapons, HIMARS, Stingers, Javelins, everything like that, the, the idea is to pile them up on Taiwan very high uh, in the next few years. But uh, China knows that all those shipments are delayed and that Taiwan is very far from ready. Oh, there's my timer telling me to be quiet. But uh, China knows very well that Taiwan is not nearly ready and it would probably take at least five years, maybe 10, to, to really prepare the island adequately, in my view. Uh, after all, they've spent uh, well under 2% for decades. It doesn't go away overnight. So uh, I, I believe we are in a very dangerous period right now with Taiwan. OK. Um, so Admiral Mertz, it's, uh, we're going to move to you to get us to kind of lean in to the future a bit. Um, and discuss a little bit about, given all of this and some of the uh, implications that you've already heard, um, you know, what's next for the U.S.? Where, where does the U.S. go with all of this? Um, and maybe even where does the U.S. Navy go mm -hmm. with all of this? Okay, thanks, Roz. Uh, first of all, uh, Admiral Daly, everybody, it's great to be back here at the Naval Academy. I think the last time I was here in an academic setting was when I had to retake my thermal final um, <laughs> as a, as a uh -huh. And like everybody else, five minutes is a tall order. We would call those three beer discussions in the Navy uh, for 40 to 50 minutes. Uh, but I'm going to hit some high-level high, high level points, and maybe that will engender some, some other discussion. Um, if fundamentally, with both these countries, and the Navy for one, and I personally now look at this as a single problem set, um, really tough to separate them out. And mostly because they're driven by the same motivation. Uh, it's not geopolitical, it's survival. Um, and it's always survival with an authoritarian uh, regime, regime. And I'll get to how the national defense strategy addresses that here when we, I uh, end with how, how we're going forward. Um, but if you look at the history of these two countries, um, particularly with Putin, if you remember, he was you know, quite pro-Western in his first his first term, at least hourly. And, and everything is hourly, and I, I can't remember who said it, but I, I, I disagree. I think he, he deeply understands the United States, um, and he tries to manage that. Um, his biggest fear is internal, um, not external. So this whole thing started to become un unraveled in the early 00s and the mid 00s, which eventually culminated in Crimea. Um, because of the uprisings all around the world that were coming to tragic ends for the authoritarian rules in place at the time. Um, so if you kind of go through that, you look at Ru uh, Russia's security agreements with the US uh, early in Putin's uh, tours, and then how he saw how those security agreements were manifesting in the destruction of these authoritarian regimes around the world, he started getting quite nervous. Uh, and if you can, you can, you can certainly click through some of the uh, some of the uh, the big ones, uh, you know, Serbia, Libya, Egypt, Iraq, uh, which we had a direct hand in, and twice in Ukraine, uh, which hit um, uncomfortably close to home for him, and his popularity was going uh, down. So uh, his view of the world is. Uh, a nationalistic approach. Uh, you generate nationalism in his mind by generating uh, success and conflict uh, externally. So you go back to Crimea, his, his popularity went through the roof after Crimea. He continued that theme into Syria. 
the elections, uh, and now obviously in, uh, in Ukraine. Um, which kind of brings us to the tie to, to China, uh, who may have a similar problem. And backed by China, you, Putin's in a little bit, uh, a little bit better, better place. Uh, he was feeling the heat, and a lot of these, you know, the color revolutions, as we refer to them, uh, ultimately ended up in Zelensky being in, in, in power in Ukraine. So when you get to the lessons learned of um, the invasion of Ukraine, from a military standpoint, um, none of this made any sense uh, to us as we saw this play out, other than understanding the tide to his survival uh, by ensuring Ukraine did not go to NATO. And if you remember early on, uh, he was okay with Ukraine making its own decision on whether to join NATO or not. That was you know, approximately 20 years ago. Uh, so you know, a, lot has, a lot has happened. But if you look at what he did in Ukraine, um, and, and you can refer to it, if you remember uh, Secretary Rumsfeld's uh, description of the known knowns, the known unknowns, and the unknown unknowns. I think they did a Saturday Night Live skit about about that. And the known knowns are, you know, what your intel tells you, what you know your own force can do, and that you know the enemy um, is going to have a similar plan. And the known unknown is you're not really sure what that enemy is going to do. And then the unknown unknown is something like uh, Zelensky, who was a comedian a few years ago, and now we're all taking leadership lessons from him. Uh, so you just can't plan this stuff out. Uh, Putin and his team on the outside seems to, not, to never get past step one of the known knowns. Uh, 96 hours in and out is what he was told uh, by his team. You know, to the degree you believe it or not, you know, here we are nine months later. And as everybody, I think, chimed in together, it's just not going well uh, for Russia. So as that is a setting, in my last minute or so here, I will tell you, um, and I very much appreciate the remarks of Dr. Friedman before, uh, we do have a lot of smart people looking at this, both academics, uh, in the administration, in the departments. Um, it's a wicked hard problem, and there's no, there's no easy solution. But fundamentally, the core of the national defense strategy is this notion of integrated deterrence. And, uh, and I'll be mindful of the classification. But that really means a whole government approach to dealing with mostly China uh, and, then, and then Russia. And we still somewhat believe where China goes, goes Russia, uh, depending on their uh, state of their relationship. If you look at China, they're really not in a bad position right now with Russia. Um, and they can you know, totally unsettle that with an invasion of Taiwan, um, you know, a catalyst that's going to organize the region. And if you compare the two regions, uh, in the Pacific, there's no NATO in the Pacific. Uh, there's no consolidation of effort. Uh, last check, uh, I was involved with 35 bilateral relationships in the Pacific, and they all hate each other. <laughs> uh, except typically, historically, they could agree to hate Japan, but I think China's mostly taken that, mostly taken that over. So this is a lesson on our side that um, what Russia tried to do just looking through the lens of military, very hard to conquer a resisting democracy. Uh, we have intel. We have deep intel. Uh, we will act on that intel. We will share that intel. Uh, and this is very, very hard to do without friends. Um, so you turn that into the Pacific. And I think one of the points of Dr. Friedman was, um, I don't know if he meant it, or he um, was just making a discussion point of, you know, who cares if Taiwan goes? Uh, well, I'll tell you that the, the region is largely feeling the same way. Uh, we saw it coming, uh, fait accompli. So we spent a lot of time out there explaining to the 35 bilats why you do care, because you're next. Uh, he's a hegemon. He's, he's not, he's, Taiwan is, is job one, uh, but it's not going to stop there. If you want to read a great book on how China thinks about negotiations, read Poorly Made in China. And it just kind of tells them everything's a point in time for them. There is no deal. There is no end point. It just, just continues on. So this whole notion of integrated deterrence, uh, thought of by a lot of smart people, uh, it's exactly what I think we needed to bring the departments together uh, to prevent a conflict. Um, when you talk about the spectrum of war, of peace to total war, and then nuclear war, which becomes somewhat nonlinear beyond that, uh, it's all about deterrence, uh, starting with Europe, ending with China, uh, and uh, you know, some point of 
uh, a, a quo status as we go as we go forward. Um, and then finally, I'll just leave uh, the point, Doc, kind of in your lane, uh, the economics, uh, completely different between Russia and China. You know, we are in deep with China economically. And I think that's going to play to our favor, uh, to keep China at a much higher level of discussion than we ever have with, uh, uh, with Russia. I'll stop there. Great. OK, so um, I'm going to ask, we only have about 15 minutes, and we'll go to audience questions. So I'm going to ask a kind of a combined question. Um, and I'm just going to kind of go down uh, the palace. So uh, if you think about the domestic conditions within each country, so Russia and China, and you think about the trends that you're seeing, um, it, this could be in economics, it could be in technological space, it could be in the political space, the diplomatic, military. Um, but thinking about some of the really key uh, drivers or trends that you're seeing, if you could just pick one of them, um, and then maybe describe why you think that's an incredibly important thing for the United States to be considering. So the, like maybe the next three years, what should we be really watching in terms of one of these sort of internal drivers um, that could affect sort of domestic stability, the domestic capacity of, of China or Russia to act and or to collaborate and, um, and work together? So Chris? Well, I'll start with something that no one's ever thought of, which is like, when's Putin going to leave the sea? I mean, and this is becoming a near-term possibility, if not probability. So uh, 70 years old, but so what? I mean, he's in good health. Uh, we are in a situation uh, that we have never been in, you know, uh, at least not under Putin when he has uh, bitten off more than he can chew, and, and probably, in my, in my view, is starting to realize that. Um, people around him are starting to, re have clearly started to realize that. Uh, his mobilization uh, was something that he did not want to do, partial mobilization. I think it was something that he felt he had to do in order to sustain the war effort, but not something he wanted to do. He wanted to leave the population out of this. So to me, the possibility of Putin's near-term removal from power has gone from almost zero as of this time last year to something much greater than zero. And that's something that is not only um, going to have you know, potential impact for Russia going forward, but for us too. And what I, I'm concerned about, speaking for myself, is I don't know that I or my Colleagues uh, have uh, come to uh, a good understanding of what we do. You know, what do we do if if there is some change of leadership in Russia? How do we handle that? Uh, how do we adapt? Um, you know, our impulses to one help Ukraine. Number two, um, not humiliate Russia. Or three yes, humiliate Russia, uh, or for try to ensure the breakup of Russia. There will be competing you know, impulses, not just here in the United States, but among <coughs> our allies and you know, with our Ukrainian partners. These are going to be the most extraordinarily difficult questions. And in some cases, we won't have uh, control over the situation, even some of the some of the parts of the equation that we think we have control over. So to me, this is becoming um, you know, not a probability. I, I think personally that Putin will still find a way to hold on and go out like Stalin did, like in the famous movie, Death of Stalin, be something like that. Um, but uh, but the, the possibility of a near-term removal of Putin uh, is becoming uh, more and more uh, important to think about. Wow. Um, yeah, I guess, I mean, uh, if the question is, what, uh, what, is I'm, what am I watching that, that can, yeah. in this relationship that could uh, be pivotal in the future? I mean, I guess I'm seeing a debate unfold in Beijing. Um, uh, we're not, we don't have, um, uh, too many glimpses of this, but but some hints that between sort of commercial elites, 
who don't want to have anything to do with this war and just want to keep everything you know, hunky-dory with trade with, with Europe and, and the United States. And, and then uh, the very powerful security elite in Beijing, which is uh, really the polar opposite. They're uh, extremely hostile to the United States. They, um, they're very pro-Russian. Uh, you know, for, for uh, decades, um, China has sent its uh, top officers to go study in Russian academies. Now, you know, you may say, ha, 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 they you know, didn't learn anything useful. But one of the results of that is that they uh, have um, you know, truly become in incredibly sympathetic uh, to uh, Russia. And that is very, you know, if I, you know, taking a sampling of a lot of Chinese uh, publications, particularly, you know, foreign policy and defense oriented, uh, it's really shocking how deep that sympathy goes. Um, you know, it would be surprising, I think, for many of you to see the words. Uh, you know, just in Global Times last week, there was an article talking about this. The Anglo-Saxons are reaching for you know centuries of of hegemony. Uh, you know, really putting it in these very crude, racist terms that we you would never see in Chinese discourse previously. And now, you know, this kind of sentiment is emerging. This was from a dean at Renminda, at one of their top universities in Beijing. So. Look, um, unfortunately, if the security elites carry the day in this debate, I, I think the China-Russia relationship, which I characterize as a sort of quasi-alliance that's both broad and deep, I'm writing a book on this, uh, could get much deeper still. It could become you know, more or less a, f a formal alliance, and this could have major impact. Uh, you know, uh, today, already, China and Russia are working together on a new generation conventional submarine. And you know, the naval audience knows that conventional submarines are a very big deal. Um, you know, they're working together on heavy lift Hilo. I suspect they're very working closely on uh, V-stall aircraft again, which is highly significant. So I'm quite disturbed, and this was, there was already signs of this before the uh, war in Ukraine, but I think this is deepening. Now, uh, whereas Russia had previously had some inhibitions about this, they have fewer and fewer inhibitions about sharing. Uh, undersea technology, for example, uh, nu nuclear submarine technology, that would kind of be the holy grail at some level. And now um, I think Russia, uh, China can increasingly take access of this. And we have this uh, very um, troubling possibility of uh, marrying up sort of uh, China's knack for big projects and getting things built, engineering prowess with, with Russia's, um, you know, whatever you want to say about Russia, they have over decades built some interesting uh, innovative weapon systems, right? Uh, you know, don't forget Sputnik and the first SLBM and a lot of achievements there. So if you marry those together, in a very fundamental way, which I think is, is potentially in the cards now, this is a problem for the United States. Uh, similarly, um, it's the future of Putin and Xi that, um, or what I spend most of my time, you know, at least researching and having discussions on. Uh, Putin is a little more concerning right now just because he's running out of options. Um, I don't think he'll ever leave on his own. It doesn't typically turn out well for dictators to leave. I think 70% of them are either killed, jailed, or exiled. So there's a real motivation to stay, uh, to stay in power, and that comes back to the discussion on uh, survivability. But then you look at Xi, uh, who will be you know, pushing 80 at the end of this decade, uh, although he just got reelected for what all intents and purposes will likely be a life, life term or sentence, depending on how you look at it. Uh, and does that, de does that decompress a little bit or not? Uh, I mean, he does plan to get Taiwan done on his watch. I think he's very serious about it. Um, I think he's more comfortable with a policy of ambiguity than not. Um, but it really depends on how much that leverage with Russia is going to play out. And I think that'll go a long way to figure out you know, Putin's next move. Um, so in a little detail, what I said earlier about you know, China's in a relatively good spot with Russia. I mean, they're, they're in a position to leverage their, their energy resources. They're in a position to leverage their uh, military technology, which we respect highly. Uh, we agree with you 100%. They have tremendous engineers in, uh, in, in Russia. And, uh, and right now, they um, had very little skin in the game regarding you know, Western attention at them regarding sanctions and other actions. So they're really kind of you know, running this nice balance to the degree they can keep it going and to the degree that keeps you know, Xi in a, in a good place, at least for now, hopefully maybe to turn domestically in a little more constructive manner than villainizing uh, the West. So it really is uh, the next step for these two leaders are the, you know, the trends, the crystal ball that we're, 
So I think I'll cover two areas. Um, I want to associate myself with what Lyle said. We heard a lot today about why the China-Russian relationship really isn't very good. They've you know, got centuries or, uh, of hostility. They were shooting at each other 50 years ago, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But I think we should remember that this is, for both of them at the moment, a very important instrumental strategic partnership that it has gotten much closer since 2014, largely because of Russia's dependence on China after the uh, annexation of Crimea, and that even though Russia's the junior partner and, and they may have different visions in the longer run, at the moment, this is f a firm partnership, and I think uh, some people today have maybe tended to dismiss it too much. Um, on the question of sort of domestic issues in Russia, I'll just associate myself with everything that Chris Bortz said. Um, I think it's it's probably likely that Putin's going to stay around for quite some time. Um, it, we, we all think, you know, given the poor performance of the army and all the problems with the mobilization and everything, you know, and the criticism he has gotten, by the way, from more hawkish elements, uh, that he's not doing enough, yeah. that, you know, maybe something's going to happen to him. But he, you know, he comes from the KGB. There are no institutions in Russia that can restrain him. This is a highly personal, uh, personalized rule, and therefore it's very difficult to see how he leaves power. But were he to leave power, and then I'll come back to, Chris mentioned the death of Stalin, I think you could see a real power struggle, because he's been sure that there, there is no heir apparent, he doesn't want to be a lame duck, and you would have various contenders for power who would all think that they should be the ones to take over. We could get a power struggle, and I've even heard some Russians say that, you know, you could get something like a civil war. We, after all, have people like Yevgeny Prigozhin, and there's a big article about him, uh, I guess, yesterday, which today in the news again, or the leader of Chechnya, Kadyrov, who have said that Russia uh, should be doing much more. Uh, and both of these particular people have a, very, a large number of armed men whom they can uh, deploy. Um, and so you, could, you really could see um, some kind of a civil war in Russia were Putin uh, to go. And then I come back to also what Chris said. Do, do we have a plan for what we would do? What would the United States do if you really do have great instability there um, in a, still a country with a large number of nuclear weapons? Okay, Randy. Well, I'm glad the 20th Party Congress is over. Um, <laughs> there was a lot of uninformed, lazy reporting on that. Uh, my favorite being Xi Jinping may get an unprecedented third term. Uh, let's see, Mao Zedong, longer, Deng Xiaoping, never. Senior party official, but he was paramount leader. Jiang Zemin, longer. Anyway, you get the point. Uh, this is Xi Jinping's China until he's overthrown, put in jail, or dies. And that was more or less a foregone conclusion before the party congress. Um, he does suffer that authoritarian dilemma of always uh, watching his back, always concerned about opposition. He has always been a pretty prolific purger, including right up to the 20, 20th Party Congress. There were major purges before the fact. I have no reason to think that will stop. So he's obsessed with power and he's obsessed with keeping power, which means I think he'll always be on the, a, a very vigilant search for potential opponents and opposition, which leads me to think, his near-term challenge is really how do you get out of this COVID zero, how do you reshape the economy? He's declared COVID zero a success, so of course it's a success, um, <laughs> but it's killing the economy, and they really need to, if they want to reach their own goals of better economic health, but also this idea of what they refer to as dual circulation, having more domestic demand, less vulnerabilities to the trade relationship with the U.S. and the West, they've got to do something about this, and, that, and that's, that's not easy. Um, which, if I could just say a quick thing about Taiwan and, and timelines. Um, Lyle made some very good points about the difference in geography, uh, but let me flip that. Uh, a small island 80 nautical miles away. Consider the amphibious assault challenge, e even from a U.S. planner's perspective. 80 nautical miles of water, mountainous inhospitable terrain, unfavorable sea conditions for much of the year, very few ports of embarkation that are in any way favorable. So in some ways, this small island surrounded by water uh, and the, the ability to concentrate firepower is also to Taiwan's advantage. And so I think the timelines there, lessons of Ukraine in, included, I personally think get extended. Um, I, I don't know what to what point. 
But I, I do know what Xi Jinping just said in his party congress speech. They are committed to so-called peaceful reunification. And I do think the Chinese want to win without fighting. So I think at least through the Taiwan election of 2024, after all, they just received a delegation from the KMT uh, in Beijing. You know, one would think they talked about, hey, what if you win? You know, uh, One would think they want to extend this just to hold out the possibility of winning without fighting, uh, in particular because the, the fight would be uh, so difficult and costly even if they were to prevail. So uh, I think the, the immediate focus is on the economy. And for us, that means, um, uh, what somebody said earlier, when your uh, opponent is struggling, uh, don't intervene, don't help them. Um, I, I think there's a lot of work we have to do. We just had this move on uh, semiconductors, chips. Um, you know, capital flows to China have actually still been increasing year on year, at, year out. Uh, there's a lot we need to do to shore up our economic side if we're going to have this integrated deterrence. Mm -hmm. It's a great phrase. Whole of government, I've always thought of as a little bit of pixie dust. Of we'll have a whole of government approach. Um, some of this is going to be difficult to wrangle and get our own house in order in terms of optimizing for competition and, and the economic piece has to fall into place. Great. Right, it's, it's time for our last Q and A for the uh, day, and uh, I'm, I'm going to take a question online to start off from William Collins, and this is a jump ball for the panel. Um, if Russia loses the war and becomes diminished geopolitically. How likely would it be for China to turn on Russia and take some portion of eastern Russia to gain access to the Arctic and reclaim disputed territories and natural resources? Uh, nothing. <laughs> Bye. Uh, quite unlikely. I mean, look, um, I, actually, this probably has crossed Putin's mind because um, you know he is uh, so devious a player. Um, and very cynical. Um, so, you know, this is one reason he's extremely serious about nuclear weapons. Um, uh, but I see uh, absolutely no evidence on the Chinese side of kind of widespread uh, kind of need for to, to take back a huge territory. On the contrary, they 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 think they're doing great at at bringing in Russian resources. Um, and I, I just have to make one quick comment on Russia-China history, because I know uh, it's been covered a lot in the panel today. I mean, it's very common to say, you know, uh, they can never get along. They, you know, they hate each other. There's a lot of racism. And the, of course, we don't have any racism going on on our, any of our borders or anything like that. But um, the point is, um, it, to my view, this has been, uh, to a large extent, exaggerated. I mean, if you look across the sweep of Russia-China relations, of, you know, about 600 years of history, is actually not one large war. There's a couple of skirmishes, basically. So, you know, we I think we need to, you know, take a deep breath, uh, think calmly about this, and know China. Even if Russia loses, China is not so stupid as to start uh, nibbling up territories in the Far East. Thank you. Uh, down here, sir. So I'm uh, Lieutenant Commander Liu from Taiwan, and right now I'm a visiting fellow in. Project 2049 Institute, and my question is about Taiwan's uh, defense credibility, uh, defense capability. So uh, Taiwan is always trying to enhance our asymmetric warfare capability, but also consider uh, the other option, uh, developing a missile capable of a long-range precision strike, precision strike, uh, such as that strategy, strategy targets maybe in Beijing. So if Taiwan does uh, have this capability, uh, will this effectively change? Beijing's calculus, or not so much? Thank you. Everyone, take a, maybe a couple people may want to comment on this. Um, I think that'd be very dangerous for Taiwan. Um, uh, we know Xi Jinping looks at the world of wars of necessity versus wars of convenience. He prefers convenience. I think that would change his timeline uh, quite a bit. I don't know that. We've not talked to Taiwan about that capability. Um, but um, in, in the world of a very you know, delicate time period, um, that may make it less delicate for Beijing. Um, when you consider all the, uh, the effects and what Xi Jinping really wants to accomplish by the, by the end of his reign. Randall, you want to take that one? Well, I just quickly add, I, I think that there would be other priorities if I were 
to advise friends in Taiwan, and uh, you mentioned a more asymmetrical force. Um, I don't believe there are asymmetrical weapons. There are asymmetrical strategies, and I think there are things that Taiwan can do to complicate a invasion scenario. Um, I also think there's been a lot of discussion about what China's learned from Ukraine, what U.S. may have learned. Taiwan has learned some things as well. And what Taiwan has learned is that leadership matters and that continuity of government matters. And uh, I know from talking to Taiwanese officials, uh, they understand that should there be military action against Taiwan, Tsai Ing-wen has to be able to continue to govern competently and communicate with her people. She needs to be able to communicate internationally. And w we need to be a partner in that and ensuring that that's the case, that she has a platform to speak internationally because Taiwan is more isolated than Ukraine, so it'll be even more important for her. So I would think of my own prioritization a little differently than, than strike capability, which carries some risks. I'm not sure I'm 100% where, where you are, but it, it, it would certainly carry some risks. Lyle. Uh, yeah, uh, I also think it's, uh, it will not uh, really serve Taiwan well. It will, certainly will not solve their problem. Um, uh, I mean, Taiwan's problem is very fundamental in that it has uh, spent well under 2% for decades, like I said. Um, it's nice that they just crossed 2% of GDP, the NATO standard. Um, that's good. But it really, looking at the problem set that you face, uh, respectfully, it should be more like 10%. And it should be 10% for 10 or 20 years to get where you need to be. So, um, you know. Uh, most I can advise you in the short term is to pour a lot of concrete and get your reserves in shape. There was a reference to the Rumsfeld quote about unknown unknowns, and this one is a bit of a jump ball for uh, both the Russia and China experts up here. Joseph Keane asks, how does Iran play into the Russia-China mix in the future, if at all, given Iran is supplying Russia with weapons for use in Ukraine? Sir? Uh, yeah, I think Iran and Russia are the, the best of frenemies. And uh, they, uh, in, in this case, uh, from what we know, Iran is supplying drones to Russia, uh, not so much for any particular geopolitical end, but uh, uh, they have a relationship. Um, it works, it uh, fills a niche. Um, the Russians and the Iranians have uh, had their moments in, uh, in Syria in which the two have not always seen things the same way, but on, on the big strategic questions about you know, Bashar al-Assad needs to stay in power, they both agree. Uh, they, they have a good understanding, but they are not, uh, they're not warm allies. And in this case, I think it's, it's really just a, uh, a supply and uh, meeting a need. It's, it's how I see it. Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree with you. Um, I mean, I think before the Ukraine war, I was focusing very much on, you know, when the Syrian civil war is over, will Iranian and Russian uh, desire, you know, policies be aligned? And I think they had different visions for what they wanted to happen uh, in Syria and the relationship with Syria. Now, I'm changing my mind a little bit because we do have this new alignment between Iran and Russia. I agree with you. It's, from the Iranian point of view, very practical. It's also a way, again, of sort of sticking things to the United States and the West. Uh, but there are fundamental, you know, Iranian public opinion is pretty anti-Russian, uh, if you look at that. So there, there are limits to that. Um, but, um, but Iran has certainly become, you know, key in this particular military phase of the war. And Lyle, you had a point? Yeah, just quickly. the. It was very interesting that uh, Russia and China ran a joint exercise, a naval exercise with Iran, I believe it was in uh, 2018 or 2019. Uh, so that, that was interesting. And I, I think they're you know, potentially developing the construct to kind of rope Iran in more and seeing some benefits. I mean, the landscape is dramatically changed, right? And if, uh, if Europe and Russia are incredibly hostile for the next couple of decades, uh, Russia is talking about you know major trade routes going south, you know, in in through Iran to India, for example. But also from China's perspective, also seeing Europe as much more hostile. Europe was the was the endpoint of the Belt and Road. Well, that's sort of starting to evaporate. So so maybe Iran really is the 
uh, becomes more the endpoint. So I see the intersection of both powers uh, in Iran, and they start to see Iran as, as uh, potentially a major plus. By the way, one reason Iran's drones probably decently, um, probably decent is because they, they've all been trained in China. Uh, Lieutenant Craig. Thank you. Over open source reporting in the past month, we've seen combined Russian and Chinese naval task groups off the coast of Alaska and circumnavigating Japan. Uh, for Admiral Murs and potentially Dr. Goldstein, what are your planning methodologies over your last two tours for the extent of Russian Pacific Fleet involvement in the event of a U.S.-China war? And for your time when you were in Yakuska, how did our Japanese partners think about the Russians and the Kuriles and next to them uh, in the event of that issue, sir? I can start with that. Um, so starting with Japan, uh, they're on the verge of uh, almost doubling their defense budget. And uh, regarding Russia and Kurils, you know, those islands are still disputed as well. Never solved, never resolved after World War II. Um, but beyond that, um, by far the minority concern out there. Uh, there's just not uh, real credible combat power by Russia. Now they're working on it, and they're moving a few submarines over there over the last year and a half. Uh, but it, it is really tough to amass any kind of threat, uh, especially with all they've expended in Europe. Uh, so they've got whatever problem they have in Europe, it's times 10 in the Pacific uh, to, to really mount any kind of credible action. Now that said, um, you know, they do uh, commit to the exercises with China. Uh, so this is another, you know, you know, vassal relationship underneath a much bigger armed force. So they're doing what they can, but, um, but really not the concern uh, in the Pacific from a region. It's probably more of a concern to the U.S. because we tend to look at the global interactions. Um, whatever happens on one side of the globe doesn't take long to ricochet over to the other side of the globe. So we're, we're constantly looking at that dynamic. Um, so it's not like it's dismissed. It's just right now uh, it's got a ways to go before it's going to build up any, anything. Do you have another part to that question? Or is that it? Uh, it was essentially just and how the Japanese think about the, the Russians in, in theater. So. Yeah, I think I got that. Uh, Randall, any thoughts on that for, nope, uh, Lyle? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you're hit on something quite important that, I, I mean, I, I really think Japan is a is quite a wild card in, from what I can sense, um, Japan, Japanese politics quite volatile. This is a country that really has never in the, in, you know, certainly since World War II, has never dealt with a serious national security crisis. They have no experience with it. They have all kinds of constitutional issues that are involved. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, would it surprise me in the least if during a Taiwan scenario that the Chinese uh, requested a favor of uh, Putin and company and said, we don't need you to invade uh, these disputed islands with Japan, but we would like very much for you to make it look like you're about to invade and, and to sortie the whole Pacific fleet and spool up in such a way as it, as it scared the heck out of the Japanese so that they were, uh, you know, lost any uh, interest in, in looking south at Taiwan. That wouldn't surprise me. On Alaska, just quickly, glad you raised it. I, you know, I'm one who thinks that, uh, you know, if we think that is secure uh, basing for for uh, Indo-Pacific scenarios, I'm not so sure. I mean, I think I, I read a lot of Chinese articles about Alaska these days. They, it's very much in the crosshairs. You know, the, the, they will look to strike those bases. You know, whether with uh, long-range air or with uh, with submarine-launched uh, weapons. Got an online question from Hassan Agun. Uh, Russian and Chinese populations are perhaps more resilient to material shortages and hardships in the face of outside threats. What's the public resolve in the United States to fight for Taiwan and face potential hardships at home? Anyone want to tackle that one? Randall? Well, according to the polling, it's increasing. There was a recent University of Chicago poll that said over half the population would support going to war to defend Taiwan. First time it ever was over 50%. Um, but I think also, you know, we have a track record. So if you doubt we would come to Taiwan's defense, uh, look what we did in 1950 with the Seventh Fleet, look what we did in 57, 58, the offshore island shelling campaign, look what we did in 95, 96, sending two carriers to the strait. So I think sometimes we make this binary, would we or won't we? I think the thought of us doing nothing, to me, is, is unlikely. I think there'd be some level of involvement. And Americans can be pretty bloody-minded. As, as long as they think there's competence, uh, uh, chance of victory, um, 
you know, Afghanistan in the end was a uh, complete and utter debacle. We, we stayed the course for 20 years. Uh, so, you know, we can be a pretty bloody-minded country and put up with a lot uh, as well. If, but, it, but it matters if they think we are being led competently, we have plans for victory, we have a way out. Um, so that would be an important factor in Taiwan as well. Wow. Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of asymmetries in the Taiwan scenario. And, um, you know, to me, uh, by the way, uh, there is an asymmetry in capabilities. I mean, look at the forces in theater in Seventh Fleet and put them against the Chinese fleet. It's, uh, it's a vast asymmetry. And th there's that tyranny of distance, which <coughs> really dominates the whole scenario. But there's also this other asymmetry of will. Right? I mean, Chinese uh, talk all day about uh, unification. Um, as an and all Chinese uh, can find Taiwan on a map. How many Americans can find Taiwan on a map? There was actually a poll recently. The numbers were uh, incredibly small. So I mean, uh, you know, I think this is uh, it's quite far-fetched uh, to, to think uh, that Americans will, will uh, go for this. And by the way, that affects how China uh, goes about the scenario. They, I don't think they will attack Americans first. They will force the US to be in the position of shooting first at, at Chinese ships and whatnot so they can tell their population it was the Americans who decided to intervene. We did not start the war. They'll try to put us in that difficult position. And I don't envy that president. But I think it will be very similar to Ukraine, where he says it's not worth World War III. After all, China is a, already, as was said, a robust nuclear power and will be more so in the coming years. I can just uh, close on that. Yes, sir. You know, whether there's will or not, um, there is singularly no greater focus for us than Taiwan. And that's just not a good place to be if you're the adversary. Uh, so we're working very hard. Over here. Thank you. Thanks, sir. No, thank you all for your uh, time today. Um, really means a lot. Admiral Merce, good to see you again. Um, so I'm interested in the panel's thoughts on the U.S., especially here in the Naval Academy, the, the U.S. Navy and the U.S. Marine Corps' capacity, um, and kind of to your point, sir, you know, um, 6,000 miles across the Pacific Ocean, is the Navy capacity with the 30-year shipbuilding plan dropping us down to 280 ships by 2027? Do we have the capacity to sustain a fight against China, um, not only from the ship perspective, but maybe also with the VLS cell ca uh, capacity, not capability? So this definitely is a three-year discussion. Um, I will tell you, you know, as the author of the last shipbuilding plan the Navy owned, uh, it's now held at the DOD level. Uh, you know, a couple things about the shipbuilding plan. Um, you know, our industrial capacity is probably the biggest concern versus China. Uh, we do account for attrition in our, in our shipbuilding plan. Uh, can't tell you how much or, or when. Uh, but the... Uh, the, the overarching you know, view of this, and you know, mentioned Seventh Fleet you know, pales in size compared to China, but when you, com when you combine Seventh Fleet with the JMSDF, with the Royal Australian Navy, and if you can get the rocks off the peninsula, they got, they got a serious problem to the north. Don't kid yourself about that. Um, it's, it's not so out of balance uh, in numbers, uh, personnel. And then you have 3MEF, which is about the size of Seventh Fleet, also on Okinawa. So each of those bring about 35,000 personnel, 70 ships, and all the, all the Marines. Um, so uh, I'm not going to tell you we have what we need, um, but we're certainly not out of the fight on day one. Uh, and then there's the whole American approach to war, which drives Xi Jinping crazy. Matter of fact, drives us, us crazy on, on, a, uh, on occasion. Um, and, and it's not hubris or overconfidence. It's just that if you look at the U.S., we've been in a conflict almost every year of our, our existence. Uh, and that just builds a lot of uh, experience uh, and planning and, and our ability to, to, to force this. And I didn't mention it earlier, um, but now that I uh, mentioned the, you know, the Japanese and the Australians, and uh, you know, one of the things that does really concern Xi Jinping is when we do operate together as friends. Um, and if you want an immediate demarche out of China, you know, do something in the East China Sea or the Strait or even in the vicinity of the Strait uh, with, a, with a, a partner or ally. Um, it really concerns them. And that, I think, hip checks a lot into what they're seeing in, 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 in Ukraine. So there's still you know, a lot of levers to pull. And the geography, notwithstanding Taiwan, 
but the greater region absolutely favors the visiting team. Um, it's just the Taiwan, you know, burr that is just um, just a just a big challenge. So I think that kind of gets at your question, um, but we're very uh, very attuned to this. Uh, the friends and allies is, is is a huge piece of the Western Pacific. Uh, you know, Japan. You mentioned some constitutional issues. We were all very hopeful when there are, you know, their Article 13 came out a few years ago. It really didn't change much, although it's starting to change it now. Um, I went back to Japan a few weeks ago, and I was amazed at the uh, level of attention and enthusiasm just over the year, and it's just been a year since I've left. Um, so they're very focused on, on the problem. And the Australians, I mean, the problem, I mean, you have more trouble keeping Australians out of a fight than, than <laughs> in a fight. Uh, they're the only ally that have fought with us in every conflict uh, since World War II, probably one. They were in World War II with us, too. So, uh, uh, so there are a lot of players out there. And in the U.S. view of the world is, um, I don't really care what jersey you're wearing. We just need the jerseys on the field. And they're coming in droves. Uh, you know, we're, we're back in Vietnam, Indonesia, um, slow, but um, they're, they're building incredible power. I think the coming through the election in the Philippines uh, was enormous. Uh, we didn't know what direction that was going to go. Uh, it turns out we have much more access to the Philippines now, which is very helpful for the Marines as we try to control the geography. So, uh, so we're doing our part, and, and we're compelled to do our part, and, and we'll see how it goes. Thanks, sir. Lyle, well, real quick, and then I want to get to the midshipmen and to the Marine. Yeah, well, and just quickly, I don't, I, I'm very concerned about the balance. I, I don't think, as I see the fight, it does not favor the visiting team. It favors the home team. Uh, just look at the number of bases and the lay down of forces. Uh, you know, and, and uh, the only ally, there are a lot of countries in the Asia Pacific, uh, but the only one that I'd say is definitely on, on board is Australia, and I, you know, I don't think that they bring that much the fight, uh, certainly not enough to, to change the tide here. Um, uh, the last thing I'll say on shipbuilding, I, I do think the Navy is not at all uh, ready or well positioned for this fight. Um, our doctrine, I think, is, is uh, quite um, backward to be charitable. Um, uh, you know, I mean, we have a carrier-centric Navy still, and the carriers are not going to carry this fight, not even close, uh, not at all, maybe. Um, and we might lose a few, as the recent CSIS just uh, the game just showed. Um, but you know, I, this is going to be very controversial. I don't mean to start a riot here, but uh, we have 58 billion dollars going to Ukraine this year. That's three, about three times the U.S. Navy shipbuilding budget. Can I, can I have 30 seconds? I promise, yes. very quick. Um, Japan is much fuller in than I think you're giving them credit for. They are pushing us when I was in office for a bilateral military plan. Uh, this, they understand the proximity of Taiwan to the Ryukyu Strait and, and uh, Ryukyu Island chain and uh, Miyako Strait. They're much further in than I think you're giving them credit for, and they, they are by far our most important ally given our, where our forces are distributed. Um, so I, I, I think the, the other thing is we've got to get out of this mindset of ships are important, shipbuilding is important. We've got to get out of this mindset of, of counting platforms when we look at this contingency. Uh, Congressman Gallagher recently said, look, this isn't easy, but it's not complicated. We need to blind them and sink a whole lot of ships. Mm -hmm. You don't necessarily need a ship to sink a ship. Over to the midshipman. Uh, thank you for coming, uh, midshipman second class to Castro. So given uh, some of the events that you guys mentioned uh, that have happened, like the 95, 96 Taiwan Straits crisis, um, the uh, Make it up. Sorry. <laughs> uh, US, US involvement in uh, backing uh, color revolutions and regime change in Ukraine and uh, Libya, Syria, and also you know, sanctions and other US foreign policy actions uh, leading to what you described as the greatest glue between Russia and China being uh, opposition to the US. So the US kind of having these actions that draw these two countries together. Um, how can our how can we prevent our future actions uh, from being perceived as kind of antagonistic as a lot of these actions were, uh, and from further drawing these two countries together, and also from 
you know, increasingly putting us at odds with them. Yes, ma'am. So I, I have to start off, I mean, this business about US backing of color revolutions in the post-Soviet space, that is a Russian talking point. Um, you know, we, we did not actively back color revolutions. This is how the Russians want to present it. We had some US NGOs that were doing democracy promotion in some of Russia's neighbors. And, but the problem is that from the Kremlin's point of view, the, you know, I mean, I think the, the ultimate joke was in 2004 when they said President George W. Bush and George Soros were in league because they were both promoting color revolutions in Ukraine. So I think you have to be very careful. Uh, the US government is not doing that. If there are NGOs that are doing it, that's so be it. We are an open society, and the Russians don't differentiate between, between the two. Um, so, but I, and I think your, but I think your question is important because obviously, if you look at the way Russia sees what we do, they put obviously the worst interpretation on it. Uh, Putin, uh, you know, thinks that we're trying to get him out of office um, in Russia, and there's not that much we can do to change Russian perceptions. I mean, even uh, in the first Putin term to which you alluded, he looked as if he was more interested in having better relations with the West um, until about 2003. Uh, but still, if you look at the things that people in the Kremlin were saying at that time, there was still great suspicion uh, of the United States. I mean, really, the only time uh, since the Soviet Union collapsed when the US and Russia worked together uh, quite well was in the fall of 2001, at the, the beginning stage of the war in Afghanistan, when the Russians were helpful, uh, because of course they, the Soviet Union had been involved in a war there. But we had very similar short-term interests. We wanted to get the Taliban uh, out of power. So, um, uh, but beyond that, there is always the suspicion of, of what the US does. So I think we have to be careful the way we phrase things, but we should not get caught up in believing the rhetoric of the Kremlin. If you, take, else? If you take the lens that they're you know, survivalists at the heart, uh, even early in Putin's term, Russia was so weak at that point, um, <coughs> that was, could almost be interpreted as just a holding statement uh, in, in, until they had a chance to get their feet from, under, underneath them. And then that was kind of accelerated with all these revolutions that uh, showed that this, this could happen uh, again. Uh, while I got the mic, I just want to, you know, challenge back to my comrade here, Lyle. Um, <laughs> just so everybody in the room understands that uh, we have migrated considerably away from a carrier-centric navy. That's just a piece. Um, we're very much now a cross-domain navy, and, uh, and it's just the evolution of the threat that's driven us that way. So uh, if you've ever served out in Seven Fleet, the Seven Fleet you see today is nothing like you saw even five years ago on the, the speed of play and how distributed the force is. And, and that is where uh, uh, the Australians and the Japanese are weaving into the strategy. And it also creates a operational approach that is very welcoming to other countries because it can very quickly impedance match to a, company, uh, to a country's uh, capability. So uh, uh, for whatever it's worth, I'm a lot more confident than my, my, my teammate here. Um, uh, after looking out my windshield at these folks for the better part of my adult life. Uh, it's, it's no free chicken, nothing's easy, um, but uh, uh, we're by no means out of this thing either. Last question goes to our Marine. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Chris George. I'm a China Foreign Area Officer. I've got tours in Taipei and Beijing. Um, <laughs> curious to hear your thoughts. Ambassador Harris this morning brought up that he thinks we should move away from strategic ambiguity to strategic clarity. And I think he was basing some of that based on a strategic clear no to Russia helped encourage them to invade in Iraq and that his thinking is a, a, a strategic yes would be a, a more effective deterrent against China. But building a little bit on what Dr. Goldstein said earlier about Taiwan needs to spend more money, my, my fear is that strategic clarity for Taiwan might encourage them to to pull back a little bit and not spend the money that they might otherwise feeling the, the heat. So I'm curious to get any of the panelists' ideas about whether you think strategic ambiguity or strategic clarity is a better way forward. Sounds like a great secretary question. <laughs> so I agree with everything Admiral Harris has ever said and ever will say. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> um, I think the president has already done that four times. And uh, you know he can be walked back, but President's words matter. Uh, 
I, I think one of the mistakes has been to look at this as binary. You're either strategically ambiguous or strategic clear and in fact we've been becoming more clear over time I would include the president's comments on that but if you look at the Indo-Pacific strategy side by side over the years we have become more, much more clear about our interest in Taiwan preserving its current de facto status or, or better and our concerns about changing the status quo through use of force um, I, I think there's always going to be a degree of ambiguity uh, my friend Dr. Kurt Campbell in 1996 said what we really need is strategic clarity and tactical ambiguity. We should be clear about what our interests are, we should be clear about what we support, we should be clear about what we oppose, but how we intervene would be contingent and scenario specific or dependent, excuse me. Um, we have a, a, a wide spectrum of, you know, uh, direct fire power to things that are less visible, so uh, we still have a Congress. We have a Taiwan Relations Act that says maintain the capacity to resist, re resist force, but it doesn't say we have to do it. So there's always going to be a degree of ambiguity, but I'm, I'm very much in favor of moving in the direction of greater clarity with respect to our interests and what we oppose. Lyle. Uh, yes, I, I um, like Admiral Harris very much, but I fundamentally disagree with him <laughs> and my friend Randy, too. I, I think uh, strategic clarity would be an incredible uh, mistake, potentially even a catastrophe. It, it, I think it's highly likely it would cause the war that it's trying to prevent uh, because China would move immediately or very quickly after that. Um, you know, to me, uh, George Friedman has to be actually the correct question. It was hardly noticed, but he said, who cares? Uh, when you're a defense planner, that's how you have to think about things. Cold-hearted realist, put ideology aside. Uh, what is required for U.S. national security? And Taiwan simply does not uh, uh, make the cut. Now, uh, and by the way, Kissinger and Nixon were 100% correct in their evaluation of the island's importance and in, in realizing that you know, U.S.-China relations were actually much more important. Now, I'm not naive. You know, China could become a really um, you know, obnoxious, assertive, uh, Putin-like uh, uh, country. It could. It hasn't. It hasn't used force since 1979. That's a pretty, pretty long track record of peace. So we should have red lines. But those red lines should not be drawn over Taiwan. That's a fundamental error. It is not defensible, and it would put our country gravely at risk, and our Navy, too. For a closing comment on that? <laughs> no. You know, come December, I'll probably have a much firmer view on ambiguity or non-ambiguity. But uh, you know, as a military, that, that doesn't even come into the calculus. Uh, we, we plan for the most pressing military scenario. And if it, happens, it happens, we're ready. If it doesn't, then we're ready, uh, either way. Okay. Well, sadly, we're out of time. Please join me in thanking our panel. As a token of our appreciation, the Naval Institute has a Naval Institute press book for each of the panelists today. China as a 21st century naval power by Michael A. McDevitt. And thank you again for your time and your insights and, and also a little bit of Give and take today. <laughs> I always like to see that. <laughs>